First of all, I want to thank the organizers and officers of the Society for inviting me to present this talk. And secondly, I wish to express my regrets that I am unable to address you in person, but circumstances beyond my control prevent it. This meeting is an especially significant one in the history of the International Society of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism, and is appropriate time to look back and review the background and history of its creation. <coughs> The circulation and metabolism of the brain have long been subjects of intense interest, but progress was limited by the lack of suitable methods to study them. In 1944, at the annual FASEB meeting, there was a symposium on the cerebral circulation. The conclusion that emerged was that there was a need for a method for its measurement, and preferably one applicable to unanesthetized man. This challenge was addressed and resolved when Seymour Keddy and Carl Schmidt published their nitrous oxide method for the quantitative determination of rates of cerebral blood flow, oxygen consumption, and so on in unanesthetized conscious human subjects. The details of the method and its applications by Keddy and his collaborators in a variety of physiological and pathological conditions were all published in a single issue of the Journal of Clinical Investigation in 1948. It was, in fact, these publications that led me to seek and obtain a postdoctoral fellowship with Caddy in the University of Pennsylvania in 1949. The method was at first exploited mainly by physiologists, pharmacologists, anesthesiologists, and internists in various specialties of internal medicine, but soon afterward also by neurologists and psychiatrists. It led to an enormous expansion of knowledge of the blood flow and energy metabolism of the human brain and its impact was aptly summarized by Carl Schmidt in his monograph on the cerebral circulation in 1951. Though the method contributed enormously to knowledge of the physiology, pharmacology, and pathophysiology of the overall cerebral circulation and energy metabolism, it failed to demonstrate any relationships between normal functional activities of the brain and its blood flow and metabolism. This failure was believed to be due to the fact that it measured only average blood flow and metabolism in the brain as a whole, whereas functional activities were localized to specific regions of the brain. What was needed were methods to measure blood flow and metabolism in localized regions of the brain. In 1951, Keddy moved to NIH, and I rejoined him late in 1953. There, in collaboration with William Landau, Walter Freigang, and Louis Rowland, we undertook and succeeded in developing a method for measuring rates of local blood flow in the brain in uh, unanesthetized animals. The method was based on the principles of inner gas exchange between blood and tissues that Keddy had mathematically described and published in Pharmacologic Reviews in 1951. A generalized model and corresponding operational equation are shown in the next slide. The first application of these principles <laughs> had been in a method for measurement of muscle blood flow published by Keddy in 1949 in the American Heart Journal. Radioactive sodium-24 sodium chloride was injected as a pulse directly into a muscle, and its clearance from the muscle was measured. Because the tracer is injected directly into the tissue, the arterial concentration, CA, and therefore also the entire first term in the equation are equal to zero. The second term describes the clearance of tracer from the tissue, and the rate of blood flow to the tissue can then be derived from the clearance constant, which is determined from the semi-logarithmic plot of the time course of loss of tracer from the tissue. The sodium clearance method was, of course, also tried in brain, but proved unsuccessful because sodium does not readily cross the blood-brain barrier. We therefore chose a freely diffusible inert radioactive gas, I-131 labeled trifluoroiodomethane as a tracer for measurement of local cerebral blood flow. Because quantitative autoradiography was used to measure local tissue concentrations simultaneously in all parts of the brain, only one time point was possible. We therefore infused the tracer interve intravenously and applied only the first term of the operational equation, for example, the saturation phase. Because the tissue concentration is then zero at zero time, the second term in the equation is also equal to zero. As we hoped, 
This method succeeded in demonstrating that local blood flow in the brain does indeed change with alterations in local functional activities. The original method was, however, rarely used because it was technically difficult. I-131 trifluoroiodomethane was not commercially available and had to be repeatedly synthesized because of its short half-life. Also, it was a volatile gas at room temperatures and autoradiographic exposures had to be done with frozen tissue slices at temperatures below minus 15 degrees centigrade. These limitations were subsequently overcome, first by Rivich, who adapted the method for use with, non, uh, with a non-volatile tracer, carbon-14 labeled antipyrene, and later by Saccharata with a more diffusible 14C iodo antipyrene. The same method was later adapted by Herskowitz and Reichel for use in human subjects by using O15 labeled water as the tracer and positron emission tomography for localization. Niels Lassen joined our lab at NIH in 1957, at the time when we were carrying out the experiments on functional activation of CBF in the cat's visual system with the I-131 trifluoroiodomethane method. Niels, however, was interested mainly in human cerebral blood flow. And so when he returned to Copenhagen in 1959, he applied the same principles by exploiting the clearance phase of the inert gas equation. For example, the second term of the equation. Instead of sodium-24, he used at first krypton-85 and then xenon-133 as tracers and labeled the brain by injecting the tracers as a pulse directly into the internal carotid artery. The clearance of the tracer from various regions of the brain was measured with an array of scintillation counters and the local RCBF rates were pictorially super superimposed in color on a diagram of the brain by means of a program developed by Edda Lassen. This method was extensively applied by Lassen and David Ingor in studies of local cerebral blood flow in humans in a variety of normal, functional, and clinically abnormal states. The avail availability of the Xenon-133 method led to an avalanche of studies by neurologists, psychiatrists, and neurophysiologists, particularly after it was modified for intravenous administration of the tracer by Obris and others. This led Lassen and Ingvar to organize a series of international RCF, RCBF symposia, the first two in Lund and Copenhagen in 1965 and 1968, and subsequently, usually biennially, at various places in the world. The last one was held in St. Louis in 1981. Olaf Paulson, who I believe is also speaking on this topic, may have more to say about these meetings because he was probably involved in their organization. The field was expanded from its focus on cerebral blood flow to include cerebral metabolism following the development in the 1970s of the 14C deoxyglucose uh, method for measuring local rates of cerebral glucose utilization in animals with autoradiography and its subsequent adap adaptations for use in humans with 18F fluorodeoxyglucose, first with single photon scanning by Rivich and then with PET by Phelps and their respective co-workers. The availability of these methods was soon followed by a huge proliferation of studies on cerebral energy metabolism, in addition to those on cerebral blood flow. The idea to establish a society develop, devoted to this rapidly expanding field evolved from some casual conversations between Bo Cijo and me. <clears throat> Cijo felt that there was need for a specialized journal devoted to this field, and he approached me about the possibility of establishing one. He chose me presumably because of my uh, prior experience as the chief editor of the Journal of Neurochemistry and as chairman of the Publications Committee of the International Society for Neurochemistry, that journal's parent society, when that society negotiated a change in publishers of its journal from Pergamon Press to Raven Press. Caesar thought that this experience would be invaluable in establishing a new journal. I agreed that such a journal was a desirable, but only on condition that it were the official organ of a professional society directly related to its subject matter. He agreed, and in March 1980, at a scientific meeting in Paris, plans were initiated to establish such a society and journal. The committee included uh, 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 Beau Cijo, Cesare Fieschi, Peter Hossman, Niels Lassen, David Ingvar, Igor Klatso, Eric McKenzie, Marcus Reichel, Martin Rivich, Fred Plum, 
and was chaired by me. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, this committee was uh, given the responsibility of establishing uh, uh, or uh, undertaking the task to implement the establishment of the uh, society. I was assigned the task of finding a publisher for the new journal, and Murray Harper was solicited and agreed to be its editor-in-chief. Raven Press was invited and accepted to publish the Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism on behalf of the society. Fred Plum accepted the responsibility of consulting lawyers and formulating the bylaws for the proposed International Society for Cerebral uh, Blood Flow and Metabolism. Uh, and the goal was to finalize the establishment of the society at the next RCBF symposium scheduled to be held in St. Louis in 1981. For personal reasons, I arrived late at the meeting in St. Louis and learned that the organizing committee had already met and formally established the International Society for Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism. It had also appointed Seymour Ketty as its president for life and me as its president for a two-year term. You may note that that makes me not just the society's first president, but it's only one who was never elected or ratified by its membership. The decision was also made to hold the society's first official organizational meeting in Paris in 1983. The meeting in Paris was notable for a number of reasons. First of all, the bylaws which define the society's rules and procedures are essential for legal incorporation and they were ratified by those attending the business meeting. Secondly, a new president had to be elected because my term was expiring at the end of the 1983 meeting. Because there had not previously been any bylaws, procedures for election of a president had not been defined before the meeting, and an ad hoc procedure had to be implemented. A committee chaired by Seymour Ketty was appointed and charged with the task of choosing a candidate to be presented for ratification by the attendees at the meeting. The committee couldn't decide and nominated both Niels Lassen and David Ingvar to serve as joint presidents, and their election was ratified by a vote of the attendees. The meeting was a spectacular success, not only scientifically, but also socially. The banquet, underwritten by the French drug company Synthalabo, was held at the Conciergerie, where Marie Antoinette had been held prisoner before her execution during the French Revolution. It was indeed an auspicious beginning to the biennial series of meetings of this band of brothers and sisters laboring in the field of cerebral blood flow and metabolism. At this point, I will stop and leave it to Olaf Paulson to cover the subsequent history of the society because he has been more involved in and is much more familiar with it than I. I wish you all another great meeting of the society and an enjoyable time in Barcelona. Sorry that I cannot be there with you.